Hello, I'm Beth Keen, CEO of Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, our Voices of History Theater Workshop performance in partnership with the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts. LA Museum of the Holocaust is the first survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. And almost 60 years later, we continue to honor our founders wishes by providing free Holocaust education to our community in Los Angeles and well beyond. When the museum closed to the public back in March, we were determined to ensure that we would continue to fulfill our mission and that students would continue to have the opportunity to learn, express themselves and find space to reflect on the issues of today and the hope for a better tomorrow. Our goal is to empower the next generation of leaders to be effective advocates and leaders, which is why we were thrilled when the staff of the Wallace agreed to join us in creating a meaningful program virtually. As Holocaust survivors show us every day at the museum, storytelling is important to foster empathy and cross-cultural understanding. These students have spent the last two weeks hearing from survivors learning about the Holocaust and writing a theater piece that encompasses the important messages of resilience, humanity, and survival. We believe theater can be a catalyst for change and has the power to move us. And we believe the students today are doing just that in the face of such an unprecedented time. I would like to thank the team at the Wallace, Rachel Fine, Chief Executive Officer, Mark Slofkin, Director of Education, and Deborah Pascarette, manager of community engagement, our theater mentors, Abby Cole and Ann Noble, our partners at LA Opera, Stacy Brightman, our museum staff, Lisa Weissman, Michael Morgenstern, Catherine Semmel and Jordana Gessler, the, stu the students for stewarding this legacy, their supportive parents, and of course, our beloved survivors, Joe Alexander and Rita Laurie. It's my pleasure to introduce Mark Slafkin, Director of Education for the Wallace. Thank you, Beth, and welcome everyone. I wanna add my thanks to everybody who has logged on this afternoon to see the work of our, of our students. Um, our mission at the Wallace aligns very much with the museum in the sense that we believe in creating and sharing stories that are important to be told and to be heard. And under the umbrella of our education programs, which we call Grow at the Wallace, much of what we do is about giving people the tools, the inspiration, the support to create and share their stories. And that's exactly what Voices of History is all about. This is the third year of our partnership with the museum. The past two summers, we've been blessed for the students to be able to physically be in the museum, taking advantage of its remarkable resources, and then spend time at the Wallace, rehearsing and staging their pieces, and then performing in our Lovelace Studio Theater. So while we were all disappointed that we can't be in the theater today, none of us at the Wallace hesitated when the museum said, let's go forward and, and let's make it happen. So we've been delighted to collaborate in this virtual world and are proud to share the work um, today. I wanna to add my thanks to Lisa Weissman at the museum as well, who along with my colleague, Deborah Pascarette, has co-led the project these last couple of weeks. Um, Deborah is manager of community engagement at the Wallace, but also a talented theater artist and educator in her own right. She teaches several programs for us at the Wallace and jumped at the chance to be part of this collaboration with the museum. I've had the privilege of logging in for some of the sessions these past two weeks, and I'm really proud of the work of these students and grateful to Deborah and Lisa for their leadership to make it happen. So it's now my pleasure to turn it over to my colleague, Deborah Pascarette. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, as Mark mentioned, we were so excited to continue our partnership with the museum, even knowing that it would be just a little bit different this year and that we would be acting in very small squares instead of a large theater box that we would normally be in. And I just think that the students have taken 
they have really, they have committed such focus and their creativity and given their time. And I think that you're going to really be moved by what they've come up with. Um, it has been a challenging and incredibly wonderful morning and that all of our technical um, we had a few technical difficulties in in taping the show beforehand so you are actually going to have a wonderful treat and get to see it just like it would be at the Wallace in a live production so the students are here today to do the production live for you so I just wanted to thank Lisa Weissman, who has been an incredible partner in working with this. I feel um, so close to her. It's been so hard not being in the same room because I feel like we've had such a connection in working with this incredible group of students. And I want to thank all of the students, even before we start, because you guys have given everything to this project. And I think that I, I just can't wait for you guys to, to be able to talk about it afterwards and to share what you've learned through the experience. So. Without any further ado, I would love to have the project start. And we're going to start with Rita's story. So if everyone's ready in Rita's group, let's enjoy the performance. I knew I was going to write a book someday. I had to tell the story. I knew I was going to write a book someday. To write a book. To tell the story. My first memory was seeing the Nazi tanks out my window. It was winter. I was four and a half. Everything froze. I knew my life would never be the same. People were getting Oreos to report to the train station, and there were rumors. The Nazis were coming. There was propaganda, troops, and guns. Sugar-coating the words to make it all nice, but it wasn't. We left, my family and my cousins, and we went into the dark night. And for six weeks, we hid in the forest. We hid behind haystacks. We hid in the haystacks. Giant haystacks. You could fit all the way inside. There were Nazis knocking on doors. We hid on a farm, but the farmer's wife realized it would be safer to bring our family into the attic. Going in and out for food every day was too much of a risk for them and for us. The attic. Four feet high. Eight feet wide. And only 20 feet long. We had to be quiet all the time. Silent. No noise. Even though we were kids. Or the Nazis would find us. There were 15 of us in the attic, my family and my cousins. My dad was very religious. He prayed every day. We asked him, do we still believe in God? Why isn't God helping us? Dad told us that God had not forsaken us and that we should still believe. We had Shabbat every week, but had to be careful not to start a fire. The floor of the attic was straw. So we had to be so careful. Sometimes we would put the candles in a potato to hold them. There was so much sadness in the attic. So much sadness. There were big spaces between the slats of the barn. It was freezing in the winter and so hot in the summer. There was never enough to drink or eat. 
My little brother just started lying on the floor, never getting up, and he kept calling to my mom. And then he died. I closed my eyes and pretended that it wasn't real. Soon after, it was Shabbat. We were sitting in a semicircle, and my mother had just lit the candles. She looked around at each of us and then was very still. She put her head down, and she died. It was probably malnutrition, but we wondered if she died with a broken heart. She never got over losing my brother. There was only one small window in the barn. I vividly remember my sister and I looking out the same window and seeing our cousin shot and killed on the spot as they ran from the German soldiers. I will never forget seeing that. No matter what, we had to be quiet. We couldn't be children. We learned later that Maria, the farmer's wife, would hit her children if we made noise upstairs, so the Germans wouldn't know we were there. Quiet. Be quiet. Shh. We were there almost two years in that small space. When we left the attic, we could barely walk, and we still had the same clothes on since the night we got there. We were told to eat very slowly because we hadn't had a meal in so long. And we were told we should not look at the sun directly. In May of 1945, the war ended. We had been in the attic the same time that Anne Frank had, but we survived. It was unusual that a large group like ours hadn't been found. We went back to our village and found our house empty, but it wasn't safe to stay. Even though the war was over, there were still Russians, Americans, and Germans fighting, and we were warned about continued acts of anti-Semitism. We found that our village knew we were hiding. There was never snow on the roof because of our body heat. They helped keep us safe. No one said anything. They had to know that people were hiding there. For the next five years, we lived in a displaced persons camp. We stayed in one in Italy, and there my grandfather remarried. To move to America, you had to have a sponsor. And finally, we had a relative who sponsored us. And we moved to the Bronx. I was in seventh grade. It was my first time in school, and my teacher looked at me and said, You look smart, but if you don't keep up, I'll send you back to kindergarten. In ninth grade, we moved to Chicago. And then when I was 17, I graduated. I thought once I was far away from the attic and from the war, I would be okay. But I wasn't. I was so sad. I felt so sad. I was traumatized. I felt guilty that I had survived. I started seeing a psychiatrist, and finally, I started to feel that I wasn't crazy. I realized I needed help and I needed love. To know that I would be okay. I finally started feeling I was bending toward the sun. I got married when I was 19 to my husband, Frank. And we had three children. The sadness didn't end with me though. My daughter Leslie felt sad too and guilty. She was filled with fear and anxiety. Trauma could travel through generations. I knew I was going to write a book someday, but I didn't know how. I knew my story, but I didn't know how to tell it. My daughter Leslie told me to just start writing, to believe in myself, and I did. All I had to do was be honest and tell the story of what I remember. My daughter Leslie volunteered to help me write my story, and we wrote the book together. And I need the perfect title for my book, Bending Towards the Sun. Because that's what I did, totally like a sunflower growing. I bent towards the sun and the light. Shh. No. I don't have to be quiet anymore. 
I will tell my story. My story. You may ask why I wanted to write a book. I wrote it because I had faith now. I knew it wasn't God's fault. I wrote it because of the rise in anti-Semitism. I wrote it because of those who deny the Holocaust. I wrote it because I now know there are answers, and there are people who are willing to help when you need it. I wrote it because I wanted others to know my story. So I wrote the book, and now I tell my story. I share it with others whenever I can. I speak to schools and groups. And just this last week, I told a group of students from the LA Museum of the Holocaust my story, the day after my 83rd birthday. I found help. I found love. I will be an upstander and inspire others to be as well. I knew I was going to write a book someday. I knew I was going to write a book someday. And I will share my story. My story. And I will forever continue to bend towards the sun. I'm sorry I started moving towards the end. The flashlight was burning my leg. I'm, I'm sorry I'm so red. <laughs> it was sitting on my leg and it started to burn. <laughs> We're going to now go to Joseph's group. And so if they are ready, we would like to share Joseph Alexander's story. This is Joseph Alexander's story. We had a very good life. It was 1939 and we lived near the town square in the city of Kowal in Poland. The Germans entered the square and took some Jewish families throughout our city, including our neighbors three doors down. A good life. There were rumors that the Germans were going to come back. My father loaded our family onto a horse-drawn wagon, and we left our home, heading to our relatives. A very good life. When we stopped, it felt almost normal. We were in a German-occupied territory, about 15 and a half miles from Warsaw. I had to go to a forced labor camp during the week. On the weekend. It was hard work, building a canal. Standing in the muddy water, I got blood poisoning. By the middle of 1940, all of the Jews were relocated to the Warsaw Ghetto. It was like nothing I could ever imagine. 265,000 people in a small space. It was so crowded and there were people dying every day. Dead. Everywhere on the sidewalks, and on the streets. Everywhere. I was there for four months, and then my father decided that me, my older sister, Esther Sarah, and my younger brother, Azik, should escape the ghetto and go back to our village. We said goodbye and made the dangerous journey. It was the last time I ever saw my parents, my brother Joseph, and my sisters, Slamis and Malkalea. I moved from camp to camp. One time I was working on building a dam. The work was so hard and we only got one small piece of bread and a cup of coffee in the morning. One time I was laying cobblestone. Once I was a roofer. And once I helped build an airport. If you couldn't get extra food somehow, you would die. We all knew that. Oh, the work was backbreaking. But I always made myself available to work, to be with the strongest people. Three days after we got to Kual, the order came. All Jewish men, ages 16 to 60, had to report to the schoolhouse. And then the trains came. There were 40 to 50 people per car and only a tiny two-foot window, high up. There was no food and no water and no facilities. And people were dying in the train car. Dying 
everywhere. By the time we got to Auschwitz, three days later, almost half of the people on the train were dead. I had to step over bodies to get out of my train. Dr. Joseph Mengele was there when we arrived. He was known as the Angel of Death. He decided who went to the showers and conducted terrible experiments on people. People had been put into two lines. There was one with younger, strong people, and the other line was old people, sick people, people that looked weak. I was put in the line with the old and sick people, and I knew I had to get out of it. I knew what happened to the old and sick people. The showers. People didn't come back from the showers. When Dr. Mangale went further down the line, I took my chance and I ran across the other line, the one with the stronger people. The next morning, I found out that the people in the other line, the older and sick people, were sent straight to the ovens. I was given a tattoo here on my arm. I had no name anymore, just a number. 14284. One, four, two, eight, four. In Auschwitz Birkenau, a tailor I knew from my hometown invited me to help sew clothes with him so I was able to get extra food. A few months later, I was sent with a few thousand men back to the Warsaw Ghetto, where we worked dismantling the ghetto buildings and stacking the bricks. While I was there, I contracted typhus and I sat shivering behind a pile of bricks. I was spared because the German in charge of my group was kind. I knew that if you went into the hospital, you didn't come out. In early 1944, we were evacuated. We walked for three days and we were then shipped by cattle car to Dachau. Again, three terrible days on the train. And only two weeks later, I was sent to another camp, Koffering, where I worked digging potatoes. The good thing was that you could eat the potatoes, and we did. We had baked potatoes. And then I was transferred again to another camp, where this time I worked in a kitchen for German guards. I also sewed for the German supervisors and they gave me extra food. I wouldn't have survived if it wasn't for the extra food. In April of 1945, we were all returned to Dachau and put in a death march. We were forced to march and when people couldn't keep up, they'd be left to die or they were shot. People die from exposure, starvation, and exhaustion. At one point, a bridge was blown up just as I crossed it. That night, the German guards disappeared and the German police moved us into the village of Konigsdorf. The next day, I saw the first American tank and I knew we were free. I left right away with a group of my friends and by late May, we arrived at a displaced persons camp. I had been at 12 camps. I couldn't stay at another camp. So I lived on a nearby farm. I started buying and selling food, like flour and eggs and chickens. I even traded items on the black market. I had it very good then. I briefly went back to Kowal, where I found one of my cousins, Mark, who had survived. In 1949, I immigrated to the United States, going first to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and then, in 1950, to Santa Monica, where my cousin Mark lived. After moving to Riverside for a short time, and then to Victorville and to Fort Irwin, where I opened up a tailor shop, I moved back to Los Angeles in 1957. While my business partner helped get the new shop in Los Angeles ready, I went back to Harrisburg. There, I met Adele, and I married her two weeks later. I opened LA Uniform Exchange on Melrose Avenue, where I sold military uniforms. After 37 years, when I was 72, I retired from my shop. I will never forget seeing prisoners run into electric fences in Auschwitz. I will never forget seeing so many people beaten to death. I will never forget seeing the bodies on the sidewalks in the ghetto. I will never forget losing my family. I share my story because people shouldn't forget.
I share my story because I hear students say they don't know about the Holocaust. I share my story because anti-Semitism still exists. I share my story because there are many survivors left. When I came to America, I decided to take my brother's name, Joseph, to honor his memory. I will always have this tattoo, but my name is Joseph. We must never forget. Wow. Yeah. That was Hello. Amazing. Do I clap yet? I am going to yes. ask. Oh, hi, Joe. Yes. Hi. Oh, hi, Jim. Hi. How are you? Good. I'm going to ask all the students to make their names their names and not the period. And that way we can just have a quick Q&A. If any of our audience members want to ask a question, they can put it in the Q&A and we can, we can ask the students as well. Thank you guys so much. This was absolutely amazing. My name is Joanna Gessler and I work at Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. Thank you everyone for joining this evening. I hope you found that performance as inspiring as I did. I think that no one knew what theater on Zoom would look like. And this group of students just showed us that you can do theater on Zoom and they should probably now contact the producers of Hamilton because they can do their performance on Disney Plus. Um, I want to just thank everyone for joining. I was hoping that we could just do a quick Q&A with some of the students. Um, and see if you guys have any words of wisdom for us. And, you know, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, feel free to just raise your hand and you can unmute yourself. And I wanted to kind of start off by saying, um, what did it feel like for you to embody a character of a Holocaust survivor, a person whom you met virtually? And what sort of preparation did you go through to prepare yourself? Alana? Well, it was very, it was a unique experience, like meeting a Holocaust survivor and like knowing their story and then like trying to create and share their story. Anyone else want to answer? Yeah, I Dan. didn't hear the question. <laughs> Oh, she asked what it was like for us to meet a Holocaust survivor and then perform it. And I think it was special because you get to share something that's important and it's important for everyone to know and to be um, informed about. And and even like, if say I like, messed up one of my lines. But um, it's more about the story and the overall and what people take from it. So I think that was a special thing that the Holocaust survivors got to get to share their story and that we got to share this. That was great, thank you. Um, Chaya, you have a question or you have an answer? It was stressful. <laughs> it's like just filming it and then just playing the film was stressful. Then they're like, like we don't have or like something happened with the film so now you have to do it live in front of the said survivor and I was like you want me to do what <laughs> I'm sorry we have to do this now is there a single moment that any of you will take away from this experience one thing that you feel changed you or one memory that you will always sort of have with you forever I, um, one important memory to me is um, Joe. I found it really very powerful that he still had his tattoo on from the time he was tattooed. Um, and I just found that really memorable because 
yeah, <laughs> you know, not many people go through that experience and come out alive and being as able to talk about it as they did. Um, yeah. So there was one thing that stuck to me. It was Well, there was many things, but like one of the things that stuck to me was the saying that trauma can travel to generations. That just stuck to my head. And I thought it was interesting because I've also read it in a book, like that trauma can travel through generations. And I just thought that was interesting on how it affects generations. We have some questions from the audience. Um, so someone wants to know how much did you guys know about the Holocaust before going into this project? Or, you know, what was your knowledge base beforehand? Haya, you want to go? I knew like quite a bit because like I am Jewish. So this is something that I have learned about and have known about for as long as I can remember. But one of the things is with the experiments on like the siblings, they only ever talk about the ones with the twins and not with the triplets, which was kind of alarming for me because I am the oldest of a set of triplets. So I was like, good to know. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> good to be in this generation. Jamila, you wanted to say something? And then Bo, you'll go next. Yeah, um, so I did have listened to other stories through another workshop with the museum. And I also heard a story by my, like, from a survivor during my school year. Yeah. Bo, then Danny, then Caitlin, then Sari. Okay, so, um, well, I think I knew a lot about the Holocaust before this workshop because, well, one, I'm Jewish, and also my mom has been taking me to survivor talks at the museum for quite a few years now. And um, yeah, so I think I've actually been to a survivor talk with Joe after a few years ago. So I thought it was really cool that I got to um, tell his story here. Danny, you wanted to also share? Um, so I think I knew the basics that it was um, that there were not Jews. They were going around doing terrible acts and killing Jews, and I knew that. Which, yeah. um, but I didn't really know what it felt like to actually be in that position, or how, or the emotional, their emotional feelings. And something else I learned was that people weren't just dying and not just killing them, they're also dying because of illness and they couldn't go to the doctor. Like in Rita's story, her brother and her mom died because they were sick and they couldn't go to the doctor because they would be killed. So I think no, learning that was very, was very um, something I feel like everybody should know. Caitlin? So I definitely knew some things about the Holocaust before. But then, like, I've heard some survivor stories, but then when I actually performed and felt what the survivors were feeling, um, then I definitely understood more of it. And now I feel like I know a lot more. Sari, and then Alana. Um, I already knew, like, a lot of stuff about the Holocaust because my family's told me things and I've read books like Dive and Frank. But I've never got to act out someone else's story to them. So I thought it was really interesting that the survivor could hear their own story. Alana? I knew quite a bit about the Holocaust before this because um, I've, read, I've read many books about it. And my family has told me stuff. And an author named Alan Gratz went to my school. And he's written mer many um, books about the Holocaust and World War II, but it's different when you hear it from an actual survivor. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, what would you like to tell others about your experience of what you have learned in doing this production? Chaya, yeah. There are moments where, yes, it's obviously a very sad thing. And there was one part while 
I can't remember if it was Rita or Joseph when they were telling that story that I started to tear up. I was like, no, I'm not going to cry. But there's also weirdly sort of like a happy moment and also just sort of like a feeling of like awe. I don't know why, but when I first saw like the li- on the little box, like their faces, when I first got into like that class when they were telling the story, I was like, that's them. Like it was like the weirdest way of like meeting a celebrity. It was interesting. Um, what do you guys, what did you guys find the most challenging about this experience? Was it the tech? Okay, Finn, yeah. Um, the part that I found most challenging was actually trying to put yourself in these survivor's shoes and trying to experience what they experienced because no one can really, you know, experience what they experienced. Um, yeah, that, that, was, that was personally hard for me to embody their pain and yeah. Um, Bo, you want to? Yeah, okay, so I think the most challenging thing for me was that acting it out. I mean, I love theater, I love acting, but what was challenging for me is because it's such a heavy topic and very personal to the survivors. Um, I was I was kind of challenged by figuring out how to act it out without like using the right amount of emotion. I didn't want to be too depressed because it's a story of resilience and hope, you know, but I didn't want to be too light and like, I don't know, dismissing the heaviness of the topic. I don't know what I'm saying, but yeah. No, that's true. Alana, you wanted to share something? Um. Yeah, definitely trying to put it in the, trying to be put in the survivor's shoes was the hardest because you can't, you don't know what they feel like. Even if they talk to you, you can't, um, it, you haven't experienced the pain that they went through. Chaya, yeah. For me, because I already knew a little bit about the pain. It was just sort of like trying to not get ridiculously angry because I have like low-key anger problems. And just hearing about everyone being like, oh, what? Yeah, this happened to the Jews. Yeah, that went on. And just, you know, just I would just hear this person and be like, now I feel like punching a German for no reason. I want to give a moment. I, we have our two survivor speakers who are the mentors and inspiration for these, uh, this production this evening. And I was wondering if either Rita, if you wanted to say a few words about what it felt to watch your story and then also to have Joe share as well. Well, I didn't feel that enough of my story was really covered to get the full gist of the story. But I, I realize it's, it's, it's hard for all of you people to listen to these stories. I myself felt myself crying while you were talking. Um, I, uh, I hope you, you learned something from being there and, uh, I enjoy meeting all of you. Joe, do you want to add anything about what it felt like to, to watch these students bring your story to life on a virtual stage? Oh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, all the students, for performing. They did a very excellent, uh, excellent job very good and I appreciate that very much and the reason I still talk to all the schools to the schools to all the kids is because after all we went through today there's still so much anti-semitism going on and the Jews always try to help every other pe- every other nations, everybody, everybody other people, but none of them do ever try to help any Jews. So 
I appreciate very much what these kids did. It's it's unbelievable that the job they did, and and also you, Jordan, Jordana, for you. Thank you for bringing this on, and to let people see and hear about the experience we went through. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe and, and Rita. Can I make one comment also? Of course, Leslie. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you. I thought the performances were just beautiful. And I think the fact that you could bring tears to <sighs> my mother's eyes to make us feel what she felt like. Um, and I, you know, got a feel for Joseph's story and what, what he went through. I thought you did a beautiful job. How difficult to do this from your own rooms, from your own homes. And you know, one of the reasons we tell this story over and over again in so many ways is that is a key to making the world better, is having all of us get to meet and talk to people different from ourselves. And you all got to not only meet and listen, but then have to play their roles. And that's how we forge empathy. That's how we're able to, you know, understand people and help bring about change. So I really appreciated this. I thought it was wonderful. And thank you. Can I just say something? Of course. Okay. The reason, my main reason for agreeing to write a book with my daughter, first of all, I knew it would be a good book if, if uh, she wrote it with me. Also, it's because of the anti-Semitism that I still hear about, and it makes me very angry. And people saying the Holocaust never happened. And so I wanted to, to put it into writing that it did happen. I think that um, these fears that we hear, because these students so poignantly and brilliantly brought these critical narratives um, to stage digitally, I hope that we will ensure as a community that we will continue to fight anti-Semitism and stand up against bigotry and prejudice. And it's because of programs like this and wonderful partnerships that the museum has with the Wallace that we're able to bring such dynamic students. And you students, you guys are the future. And I think that you will go on to do incredible things and always remember these important lessons and legacies that you learned here from Joe and Rita. And I'm sure they'll stay with you forever. Um, I wanna also just thank everyone, unless someone has a last minute comment that they wanna close with. I want to thank you guys for joining us. I want to thank Mark and Deborah and everyone at the Wallace and the staff at the museum, and but most of all the students and your parents um, for supporting you in this passion and dream um, and that you guys were really able to get do so much hard work in the last two weeks to bring these stories to life. So thank you so much. I hope you guys all feel very proud. Um, it was, you guys can take a bow if you want to. We look forward to having all of you in our community and for continued programming. Um, we hope everyone found this to be a very meaningful event this evening. You can always learn more about our virtual events and our education programs. And of course, our teen advisory board at our website, lamoth.org. I hope to see some of you guys come back to that. Uh, our museum on, uh, programs continue to be online and we look forward to seeing you guys at our next event. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a beautiful Shabbat, a lovely weekend, and stay safe and healthy, and definitely keep in touch. Thank you for coming into my home. Thank you for allowing us into your home, for sure. My pleasure. <laughs>